Thank you, Cynthia. And I really want to thank the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy and West Ed for hosting us today. It's great to see so many people here to, to participate in this discussion of this very important topic. Um, I'm honored to be part of the panel, and I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you about the public health burden associated with violence in the United States. I'm going to talk a little bit today about why violence prevention is not only possible, it's also strategic. So when I started at CDC, I have to admit, this is what my family thought I would be doing. <laughs> and you know, I think it's true of a lot of people. They hear CDC and they think scientists in biohazard suits collecting samples or working in the labs. They don't think of violence necessarily as a public health problem or part of CDC's mission. Many people are actually shocked to learn about the health impacts of violence in our country. Every day, about 43 people lose their lives to homicide in the United States. And homicides really are just the tip of the iceberg. Every day, over 4,000 people are treated in U.S. emergency departments for non-fatal injuries resulting from physical assaults. We know this from CDC's National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, representative sample of hospitals. Among young people, there's a disproportionate risk. Homicide is actually the third leading cause of death among all adolescents and young adults between ages of 10 and 24. And it's, in fact, responsible for more deaths in this age group than the next seven leading causes of death combined. And we know that risk is not uniform. The risk is higher in our under-resourced urban centers. And among African-American males in our country, homicide is the number one leading cause of death responsible for more deaths in this age group than the next nine leading causes of death combined. So that's car crashes, that's fires, drownings, HIV, pneumonia, you name it. It's responsible for more deaths than all those causes combined. When people think of the health consequences of violence, we often, of course, think of the deaths. We think of the potential for disabilities and serious injuries. We might think of the mental health consequences like post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, risk for suicide. But the reality is that violence in our country contributes to most of the major health problems that we face as Americans, including reproductive health issues, um, infectious disease risk, as well as chronic disease such as cancer and heart disease. I also want to mention that violence has enormous financial costs to our country. The costs just from direct medical care of injuries as well as work loss faced over a victim's lifetimes for violence among adolescents and young adults is well over $17 billion a year. I have a hard time even thinking about what $17 billion a year is. So just to put that in perspective, that's enough money to send nearly a quarter million young people through four years of a college education. And this, just so I'm clear, only includes the medical cost and lost productivity costs. It doesn't include the costs associated with arrest, prosecution, incarceration. So I would argue that violence is both a public health and a criminal justice problem. We're increasingly hearing law enforcement and community officials say, we can't arrest our way out of this problem. We need to focus on prevention. At CDC, our goal, our emphasis is on stopping violence before it starts, trying to move upstream with prevention. Um, we focus on trying to stem the flow of people into the justice system, into our emergency departments. We use data and research to understand risk and protective factors, and then to develop and rigorously evaluate programs that work and to disseminate that information. Fortunately, based on evidence from both research and practice over the past three decades, we have substantial information about strategies that work. To help communities to better utilize this evidence and to take advantage of the best available information that's out there, CDC has released a series of technical packages. The first two are already out. They're focused on child abuse and neglect and sexual violence. We're currently working on technical packages for youth violence, intimate partner violence and suicide, and those will be released within the next year or so. I thought I would use the limited time that I have today to just highlight two specific examples of programs that are included in our technical packages. And my idea here is just to try to be really concrete about what we mean by these prevention programs. Uh, the first is child parent centers. 
um, focused on um, providing comprehensive support services for children ages three to nine in low-income neighborhoods. Um, these include structured education for the children, pre-kindergarten as well as kindergarten, health screenings for the children, um, connections to employment services and mental health services for adults. The goal really here is to keep those young people and their families connected to schools and to encourage and support healthy development. The results can be remarkable from CPCs. They've shown significant reductions in child abuse and neglect and long-term evaluations have shown reductions in arrest rates in young adulthood as well. So these are long-time sustained effects and benefits. Um, a long-term cost-benefit analysis from Chicago suggests that between $4 and $11 can be saved from CPCs for every dollar spent. And the variation depends on how young the child is when they start the program with more benefits from starting at a younger age. The second example that I wanted to share is called Safe Dates. Uh, Safe Dates is an example of a universal school-based prevention program for violence. Um, there have been a lot of school-based prevention programs that have been developed and a subset of them have been rigorously evaluated and shown to be effective. They typically focus on changing young people's attitudes, knowledge, and skills in relation to violence. Um, there have been a series of meta-analyses and systematic reviews that have been done and they show that these types of school-based programs can have effects regardless of the sex of the young person, the age, um, predominant race ethnicity within the school or SES within the school. So it's, they're fairly robust effects. Safe Dates is one specific example. It's designed for middle school students and it focuses on teen dating violence. It includes 10 classroom sessions as well as a play and a poster contest to try to reinforce the messages about positive relationship skills, conflict, conflict resolution skills, um, and anger management. There's been a systematic evaluation of Safe Dates program and it found significant reductions in both victimization and perpetration of both physical and sexual teen dating violence. And these were effects that were observed at four years after implementation. So when these middle school students were now in high school. Okay. The program was also associated with significant reductions in same-sex peer violence as well as youth weapon carrying. So it suggests the potential for the benefits of a teen dating violence program that addresses kind of core skills to have effects on other types of violence as well. So what I've shared are just two examples from the technical packages. I would encourage you to go and take a look at these if you're interested. There's many more examples of um, evidence-based programs in the technical packages. I wanted to mention that in addition to the, these technical packages, we've also released our strategic vision for our work, the CDC's work in violence prevention for the next five years. Um, this really emphasizes the need to focus on the core root causes that we were just talking about in the last session um, for violence. It also emphasizes the fact that although no group is immune from violence, we know that there are subgroups of the population that are at particularly high risk. So we know that young people are at greater risk for multiple forms of violence than older adults. We know that females are at greater risk for sexual violence, while males are at greater risk for suicide and homicide. We know that LGBT youth are at greater risk for multiple forms of violence. And we know that racial and ethnic minority populations are often at greater risk across the lifespan. So we really need, and this is what's laid out in the strategic vision, to focus on the populations that are at greatest risk with a comprehensive approach that's integrated and addresses their needs. So I just want to end by emphasizing a few points about why violence prevention is strategic. So we've learned from research across the past three decades that there are programs that work. These are programs that can be implemented within families, within schools, within communities. Many of them have lasting benefits for years or even decades. A subset of them have also been shown to have effects on multiple forms of violence or other health outcomes besides violence. The evidence is growing about the cost effectiveness of these programs. Many of them return multiple dollars for every dollar spent. It's very encouraging. Um, and lastly, these programs are available now. Um, we don't have to wait. Um, we can no longer say that we don't know what works we have the opportunity to implement these programs. And I would argue that it's not just a moral responsibility to reduce disparities, reduce suffering, but it's also a wise and strategic investment in our nation's health to reduce violence. So 
thank you so much for your time today. Um, please visit our website if you're interested in learning more about the technical packages, the data I discussed, or our programs. Thank you.